Hello, hello. Greetings, tech speakers. Uh, today we are joined for our next installment of the Mozilla Tech Briefings. Uh, today we have a special guest, Ben Francis. Uh, ben Francis is one of our Mozilla staff application engineers. Uh, he's been working with Mozilla for six, almost seven years now, if I believe. Uh, ben Francis is here to join us today to give us an update on the Mozilla Project Things. Uh, it's gone by many names over the past couple of years as it's developed, uh, Internet of Things, Web of Things. Uh, here at Mozilla, we're calling it the Project Things, and Ben will be here to tell us all about it, uh, the latest and greatest, and how you can get involved in the project. So without further ado, I'd like to yield the floor to Ben, who will be uh, giving us our tech briefing and update today. Thank you so much for joining, Ben. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I work in the Emerging Technologies Department at Mozilla and I'm working on the Web of Things and uh, uh, Mozilla's implementation of the Web of Things called Project Things. So let me give you a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So first of all, a bit of history about the Web of Things, how it came about and how it relates to the Internet of Things. I'm going to talk about the Web Thing API, which is Mozilla's proposal for a Web of Things standard. And I'm going to talk about Project Things which is Mozilla's open source Web of Things implementation, which includes the Things Gateway, which is an open source Web of Things gateway implementation that you can build yourself. The Things Framework, which is a device framework for building the Web Things themselves, and ways that you can uh, get involved and encourage other people to get involved. So let's start by um, talking about the Web of Things in general. And to do that, we have to start by talking about the Internet of Things. So there are lots of definitions of the Internet of Things. Here is one of them. The Internet of Things is a system of physical objects connected to the Internet that can be discovered, monitored, controlled, or interacted with. So it's about monitoring and controlling things over the Internet. So the Internet of Things today is mainly built on vertical proprietary technology stacks, which don't talk to each other. And when they do talk to each other, it requires per vendor integrations to make that happen. There are standardization efforts, but there's still no dominant model or standard. Uh, so the Internet of Things today is a lot like the Internet before we had the World Wide Web, when there were competing hypertext systems that didn't talk to each other. And the web eventually came along and provided a unified application layer protocol for sharing and linking information. So the Web of Things is about applying the lessons learned from the web, the World Wide Web to the Internet of Things to create a decentralized Internet of Things by giving those things URLs on the web to make them linkable and discoverable and defining a standard data model and APIs to make them interoperable. So the Web of Things is not intended as another vertical IoT technology stack to compete with existing platforms. It's meant to be a, uni a unifying horizontal layer to bridge together those underlying IoT protocols. And rather than start from scratch, the Web of Things is built on existing proven web standards like HTTP, JSON, WebSockets, and all the best practice web standards for security like uh, TLS and OAuth. But it's also going to require defining new web standards, in particular, a machine readable description format for describing things in the real world and their capabilities, an API for communicating with those things over the web, and possibly even a new version of HTTP uh, that's better suited to resource constrained devices and IoT use cases. So I'm going to give you a, a quick history because the Web of Things is not something which Mozilla invented. Uh, it dates back to at least the year 2000 when people started talking about connected objects and the web. Uh, in 2002, there was a cool town project which used URLs and HTTP to interact with physical objects. Um, 2007, Dominic Guignard and Vard Triffer um, started the Web of Things community uh, with, at webofthings.org. And Dave Raggett started giving talks at the W3C uh, and IoT events. There have been peer-reviewed publications, uh, an international workshop on the Web of Things, which has been running every year since 2010, uh, PhD theses, uh, and uh, the company Everything, which was founded by Dominique and, and Vlad. Uh, 
uh, which is a company built on ideas from the Web of Things. In 2014, there was the first Web of Things W3C workshop, which led to the creation of the Web of Things interest group and a Siemens research group. And in 2016, uh, the Web of Things interest group at the W3C proposed a charter for um, a Web of Things working group to work on some standards. The W3C is not the only standards body looking at standards in this area. So the Open Connectivity Foundation have um, a system built on CoAP, which is like a mini HTTP for resource constrained devices. The Open Geospatial Consortium have the Sensor Things API, which is quite similar and is dedicated to geospatial applications. The IETF has even published some thoughts on using the REST pattern in IoT. But the area we're most focused on is the W3C Web of Things work. And the W3C has a community group, an interest group, and a working group. So Mozilla is a member of the Web of Things interest group at the W3C, uh, where we're working with device manufacturers, software developers, and service providers to help define those standards. There's also a W3C working group around the Web of Things, which Mozilla is not currently a member of, but they have been working on these four documents. Uh, an overview of the general architecture of the Web of Things. The thing description spec defines a kind of abstract data model for describing things and has a JSON-LD serialization using semantic web technologies. They are working on a programming language agnostic scripting API and they have a templating system for binding the web of things to all sorts of different protocols. So our feedback on this uh, work so far is it's maybe a little bit overcomplicated. Bit of a simpler model. Uh, it's largely based on a previous W3C member submission from the EU funded Compose project. And we've written what's basically a single specification that covers a web thing description format and a web thing API. So that's a plain JSON description format for describing things in the real world and their capabilities, and a concrete REST and WebSocket API for communicating with those things over the web. So I'm going to uh, tell you a bit about the web thing API now. So um, some of these slides might not show up very well on the video stream, but we'll make sure that the slides are sent out afterwards so you can see the, the fine detail. Um, but this is an example of a thing description. So a thing uh, can have a name, it can have a type, it can have a description, human readable description. And you can define properties of that thing, which can be modified. You can define actions that can be requested. And you can define events, which can be subscribed to. And the thing description can also include links to other resources about that thing. So here there's a, a link to a WebSocket endpoint to talk to that thing, which I'll explain a bit more later. So just jumping into those details. So this is an example of a property definition. So this is describing a property of a thing in the real world. It's a, a level property of a lamp, which is a number from zero to 100. Um, and there's a link here to a web resource which represents that property. So the property has its own URL. This is an example of an action. So a thing can have an action. Um, this is an example of an action for a lamp which says, I want to fade the light uh, from one uh, to a particular level. So in this case, I want. Um, so I want to fade the light to a particular level with a particular duration. So the action has an input. That uh, action also has a link that you can post to to request the action. And then this is an event. Um, so this is defining an overheated event, which can be fired by the thing, which is saying that the lamp has exceeded its safe operating temperature. And the event also has a link. You can also define uh, a list of links about the thing. So there's a link here to a list of properties, an action queue, and an event log. There is a link to a WebSocket endpoint. So 
that you can control the thing. And there is uh, also a, a link here to an HTML representation of the thing. So it can provide its own custom web interface if it wants to. OK, so that's the thing description, which basically describes a real thing in a machine readable format uh, using JSON. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about the REST API, which uh, REST meaning uh, representational state transfer, which is a common way of building APIs on the web. And here's an example. So I mentioned before that a property has its own URL. So you can send an HTTP GET request to the property URL to get the current uh, status of that property. And so in this case, I've, I'm asking for the status of an on-off property of a lamp, and I'm getting a response that says, uh, it's not currently turned on. On is false. I can also uh, set that property using an HTTP put request. So this is an example of a put request where I'm saying I want to change on to true. And I'm getting a response that echoes back my request and says, OK, I've turned on to true. Now, because this is just standard HTTP requests, we don't need any kind of new special JavaScript API in the browser for web applications. They can use the existing fetch API uh, to send those HTTP requests or the old XML HTTP request API. This is an example of a fetch request to the on property of a lamp. It's using the put method to set that property. And there's also some headers here. So this is basically saying, I'm sending you a content type of JSON I'd like you to respond with a content type of JSON. And there's also an authorization header, which has got this key, um, which identifies me and says, I'm authorized to control this light. Uh, so that's the security mechanism. And then there's a body of that HTTP request, which is uh, just a bit of JSON that says, turn on to true. So there are other things you can do with the REST API. You can request an action. So this is an example of posting an action request to an action queue. So the actions resource is like a queue, and you send a post request to add a new uh, action request to that queue. So in this case, it's requesting a fade action to set the level of a lamp to 50% over a period of two seconds. And I get a response back from the server saying, your response request has been created. Um, and here is a URL that identifies that action request. And it's currently got the status of pending. So the action hasn't been executed yet. So you can also request or I think This on the list of events when a lamp has overheated. Um, now, this is obviously not very efficient. Uh, if you have to keep the HT REST pattern aren't that well suited IoT use cases. So there's also a WebSock API, which has been nice. And a WebSock standard way of opening up a, a, basically a TCP socket with a web server so that you can send plain text messages backwards and forwards. But this is an example of um, a message to set a property. Just bear with me for a sec. The slides are catching up. So this is a message to set a property over a WebSocket. It's a message type set property, and it's saying left motor 100. So this is actually a message to send to a robot to tell it to turn its left motor to 100%. And this is, um, so in JavaScript, if you want to send this message, you need to open a WebSocket. So this could be um, JavaScript running on a web page. You open a WebSocket with the thing by its URL you specify the web thing subprotocol, and then you can send a message, a set property message to that thing. Uh, in this case, again, left motor 100%. So there are other things you can do with this WebSocket API. Like the REST API, you can request an action. So this is an example of an action request saying, I want you to go forward. 
you can uh, subscribe to an event. So you can say, I want to subscribe to motion events. So whenever motion is detected, I want to be notified. And then you can receive messages back from the server. So with a WebSocket API, you don't have to have that request response mechanism. Messages can be pushed directly to you as the client. So um, this is an example of a property status message, which is telling me that the, an LED has turned on, LED true. You can also be notified of change in status. So you'll remember earlier I requested an action, but it was pending. This is a, a message, a WebSocket message to tell me that my action request has been completed. And this is an example of an event. So I, I earlier I subscribed to the motion event, and this is an example of an event message which has been pushed to me from the server to tell me uh, that motion has been detected, and it has a timestamp to say when that was detected. Okay, so that's the thing description, the REST API, and the WebSocket API. And what we found uh, from our research so far is that there are kind of three main ways for connecting things like this to the web. Um, we call them the Web of Things integration patterns. So the direct integration pattern is where a device itself hosts a web server. It has its own URLs, um, and it runs the web server on the device itself. So a, an example might be a Wi-Fi camera. Uh, which you can talk to over HTTP. The gateway integration pattern is for resource constrained devices which can't host a web server themselves. So they need a gateway to bridge them to the web. So an example might be uh, battery powered door sensors using a low power wireless protocol. And finally, the cloud integration pattern uh, can be used for when you have a large number of devices over a wide geographic area which needs centrally coordinating. So an example might be air pollution sensors. And in this case, um, the web thing API is exposed by, from a cloud service, and the devices use some other mechanism to communicate with that cloud service on the back end. So that might be an MQTT messaging service, for example. So that's the API that um, Mozilla is proposing. Uh, Project Things is Mozilla's implementation of the web of things. And it has three main components, which correspond to those three different integration patterns I mentioned. So there's the Things Cloud, which is a collection of Mozilla hosted IoT cloud services. There's the Things Gateway, which is an open source Web of Things gateway implementation, which bridges existing smart home devices to the web. And the Things Framework, which is a collection of reusable software components for building the things themselves, what we call native web things, which expose the Web Thing API directly. So I'm going to tell you about Project Things. I'm going to talk about uh, things, the Things Gateway, the Things Framework, and also how you can get involved and how you can encourage others to get involved. So first of all, the Things Gateway. Um, the Things Gateway is designed to allow you to directly monitor and control your home over the web without a middleman. So here's some example use cases of what you might use that for. So turning appliances on and off remotely over the internet, uh, having a light turn on or an alarm sound if, if motion is detected, be alerted on your smartphone if smoke is detected, or check what times the, the kids got home um, by looking up a date stamp on a, on a door sensor. So this is the basic architecture of our Things Gateway implementation. It's a web server, a Node.js web server, on the back end, which exposes that uh, web thing API. There's a web application as a front end. So that's a progressive web app that you can access on any device and add it to your home screen. And then there are adapters, which bridge various IoT protocols to that web thing API. And those adapters can be written in different languages like Rust or Node.js or Python. And then they communicate, they run in their own process. They communicate with the main gateway process uh, over an IPC mechanism. So if one of those adapters crashes, it doesn't bring down the whole gateway. And the gateway is also um, connected to this uh, TLS tunneling service, which we set up in the cloud, which makes it really easy to set up your gateway uh, and connect it to the internet in a secure way. So just a word about security. Um, the gateway is accessed over HTTPS via this Mozilla IoT tunneling service, which I mentioned. 
It uses um, a software called PageKite, which sets up a tunnel from the cloud to your gateway. Uh, it's completely end to end encrypted. So from the user's browser to the gateway is using HTTPS. So we can't sniff all the data that's going through that service. Um, every gateway gets its own unique subdomain with a certificate signed by Let's Encrypt. Or if you want to, you don't have to use that service. You can configure your own DNS, have your own domain, and configure your firewall and TLS and everything yourself. It also uses JSON web tokens to authenticate. So this is a pretty standard way for authenticating with web services so that not just anyone can uh, control your gateway. And it also supports OAuth as a way to authorize third party apps and services that may want to talk to your gateway. So we've released this gateway software as a, an OS image you can download uh, for the Raspberry Pi and flash it onto an SD card. This is uh, initially aimed at hackers and makers who are willing to source their own hardware components, uh, put them together and flash that software image onto an SD card. So you basically, uh, you need to get hold of a Raspberry Pi computer, single board computer. You don't have to use Raspberry Pi, but that's the easiest way to do it at the moment because we have a, a pre-built software image for that. Uh, the Raspberry Pi has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and GPIO and other things built in. But if you want to use other smart home protocols like Zigbee and Z-Wave, you need a USB dongles to provide that feature. So you put that all together and then you download the pre-built OS image from our website, flash it onto an SD card, stick it in your gateway and you boot it up. And then the Raspberry Pi acts as a Wi-Fi hotspot that you can connect to and then go through the, the setup process. So when you first set up the gateway, this is the web interface of the gateway, and you create your own unique subdomain for your home. So you choose your subdomain, you associate it with an email address so you can recover it later if you need to. And as I said, this subdomain gets its own certificate uh, automatically generated, signed by Let's Encrypt. So then you can add devices to your gateway. So you can scan for devices using Zigbee, Z-Wave, Bluetooth, even proprietary protocols like Apple HomeKit and Nest Weave using adapters. And there's a, an add-on system so that you can add extra adapters to your gateway to support different types of um, devices or protocols. So there's an example here of Philips Hue and TP-Link for talking to those particular devices. This is the, the Things UI, so you can monitor and control your home over the web. And it provides this unified web interface to all these different devices, uh, existing off-the-shelf smart home products using lots of different protocols. And you can control them all through this web interface rather than having a separate mobile app for each device. You can lay those devices out on a floor plan of your home, uh, kind of a spatial way. And there's also a rules engine for setting if this then that style rules to automate your devices. So for example, if one thing turns on, then turn another thing on, or if a sensor is activated, then do uh, carry out some action. We also have experimental voice controls. Uh, so the gateway can act as a kind of smart assistant for your home. So these are some of the DIY gateways that people have built for themselves using a Raspberry Pi. So people have attached screens to them, speakers, microphones, and uh, use them for all kinds of things, built their own uh, custom cases and decorated them with stickers. Uh, so you can build your own gateway and decorate it however you like. And here are some examples of uh, the kinds of devices which we've already made compatible with the gateway. So Zigbee, Z-Wave, Philips Hue, TP-Link, IKEA, smart bulbs, uh, and these photos by Lars, who does some great blog posts uh, about his experiences getting all this stuff to work together. And there's a, there's a list of what devices are compatible on, on our wiki. So finally, the Things framework. Uh, this is quite new. So it was just announced a week or two ago. Um, the Things framework is a collection of reusable software libraries for building things themselves, what we call native web things, which expose the web thing API directly. So they don't need a special gateway adapter in order to make them work. So the Things Framework, uh, there are libraries in various different languages. There's a Java library, so you can turn Android things into web things. 
um, C++ examples for Arduino type hardware. Um, there are also implementations in Python, Node.js, and coming soon is also a Rust library as well. And there's a blog post on Mozilla Hacks where you can learn more about that. And you can also go to uh, iot.mozilla.org slash things on the website to see some examples. I think there's going to be uh, another blog post going out tomorrow with some more examples by uh, my colleague Mike. So once you've built a native web thing, uh, you don't need a special adapter. You can just add it to the gateway by its URL. Uh, or you can scan for native web things, which can broadcast their own URL by using MDNS uh, on the local network, or they can even use a Bluetooth beacon uh, to broadcast their URL. So you, you can discover the devices that way, or you can manually copy and paste their URL into this interface. So just to show you some examples of things that people have built so far with the framework. Um, this is an example by uh, my colleague James. Uh, this is using the very popular ESP8266 microcontroller and an, ex an, ex an example of creating a dimmable light using the onboard LED. And you can see how that uh, then displays itself in the, the gateway uh, because it's exposing that it, it web thing description and API. This is an example um, that's going to be in the blog post tomorrow of a music player, uh, which Mike has created and exposes a web thing description and the web things API. And there are going to be examples of this in different languages, so Java, Python, and Node.js. And this is a particularly fun example by Lars. Uh, and this is a, a weather station which uses the rules engine to control different light bulbs. So there's a kind of virtual weather station which measures the wind speed outside. And it's there's a rule set here that says, if the wind speed is greater than five, then turn the the green light on. So it says kite time, because there's enough wind to fly my kite. OK, so how can you get involved? Well, there are three main ways that we're trying to encourage people to get involved. The first way is to build your own web things using the things framework. Um, so you can go to iot.mozilla.org slash things to see examples. The second way is to create an adapter for the Things gateway to bridge an existing IoT device or protocol to the web. And lastly, just hacking on Project Things, so uh, working on at Mozilla's implementation of the Web of Things. It, all the source code is on GitHub. We already have some great uh, regular community contributors. Um, and so I'd love to see you send, uh, filing issues of any bugs you find and sending pull requests. So that's about everything uh, I have today. I hope that's given you an overview so that you can go out and tell other people about Project Things, um, about the idea of the web of things and creating a decentralized IoT. Uh, you can find out more on our website at iot.mozilla.org. You can join us in IO the IoT channel on IRC. You can also follow us on Twitter and a really good place to ask questions if you have any problems or you want to ask about you know, devices that are compatible and that kind of thing is on the forum on Discourse. That's the Mozilla Discourse instance. So yeah, that's everything from me. And I think time for questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ben. We really appreciated that thorough overview. I believe we do have some questions uh, in the etherpad that have come in during your presentation. Uh, so I'll start here on. Uh, row 29, how many subdomain can the dot .mozilla uh, iot.org be used? Uh, would this be free, or will it be a freemium model going forward? So at the moment, this is completely free. We have no plans of charging for it. All we're really doing is setting up a tunnel from the cloud to your gateway. Um, this is an experiment. This whole project is an experiment. So I can't guarantee that's going to be around forever. Uh, the great thing is that that tunneling service is mainly for convenience. So you can always use your own domain in future. It's not just going to stop working because it's not dependent on the cloud service to function. But the domain, the subdomains are free. Um, you can have as many as you like, and you get a free certificate from Let's Encrypt as well. I'm sure there's some excitement hearing uh, that they can have as many subdomains as they like. Uh, and that question came in from uh, Kalyan. Um, our next question is on row 31. 
and it reads, what in your opinion would be the best outcome of the standardization process for Web of Things? That's a great question. And it's a really complicated landscape out there at the moment. I mentioned a few of the standards bodies who are trying to define standards. Um, ideally, some of those would converge. Uh, so in particular, the OCF effort, which is quite far along, and the W3C effort, uh, they are already talking to each other. They have regular syncs, and they're also talking to the IoT schema, so iot.schema.org uh, effort as well. So I'd really like to see some of those converge so that we are working towards a common protocol or at least a common uh, data model so that those things can talk to each other. So either using the same protocol or having a shared data model so that it's easy to adapt from one to the other. And then hopefully we'll see some mainstream IoT platforms like kind of the ones from Nest and Apple and Samsung and those uh, adopt those standards. I mean, Samsung Smart Things is already a participant in that, that uh, standardization process. So the idea would be that we have this um, web standard where anyone can uh, host their own web things, they can give them a URL, and uh, any web thing can talk to any other web thing. That's what we would like to see. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thanks. Back to come in from Hawk, of course. Um, our next question is on row 33. Um, how is it possible to generate the auth key uh, for making okay. the various uh, API requests, to be specific? Yeah, so um, that's a, uh, the JSON web token. So is when it's the web interface itself that's talking to the API, uh, like it, has a, it uses your login, you have a username and password that you log in. If you want to have a third party app or service which talks to the gateway, you do that using OAuth. And there's uh, in the latest dot four release, there's a kind of easy onboarding system where you can create a local OAuth uh, instance first to experiment with that. And you can set it up such that you, it, can, it can hand you a token using OAuth. Uh, if you want to know more about that, uh, come and ask us in uh, IRC, because my colleague James is the expert on the, the OAuth system and the tokens. So he can tell you exactly how to use the, the API in that way. Great. And what's the name of that IRC channel? It's IoT on irc.mozilla.org. So much. All right. Next question is on row 35. Um, our, sorry about that. Um, our previous question came in from Vicky. Thank you so much, Vicky. Um, our next question is on row 35. How do we monitor the action endpoint? Um, for example, I post a request to the turn uh, to turn on the light, but how do I monitor it continuously to check if it's working or not? Right. So there are two ways to do that. So the first way is using the REST API. So you, you request an action using a post request, and the response to that post request gives you a URL for your action request. And then you can, you can poll that, you can get it to get its status. Now, that's obviously not the most efficient way of doing it. So the WebSocket API offers a push mechanism. So with the WebSocket API, you send an action request as a message of the WebSocket, and then you get action status messages pushed back to you whenever that, that status changes. So if it's completed, you get a message. If it's failed, you get a message. Uh, and you don't have to keep polling the server. Thank you so much. And thank you, Vigneshwar, for asking that question. Um, one more question. Where has he built a monitor dashboard for Web of Things APIs? Um, people are certainly working on them. So one of the features we're working on, uh, an experiment for the dot five release is a time series database and having a user interface for that, which provides uh, graphs. So you can graph data over time. And I believe my colleague James is looking at lots of different existing time series databases that you could plug into the gateway using its API and, and create all kinds of dashboards and graphs and things like that. Thanks so much. Uh, is it possible to efficiently stream video through Web of Things APIs? We think it's possible. So there's a few community members who have been experimenting with that and have actually created Web Things camera Web Things, so a webcam. Um, and so far, I think the way that works is by providing a URL to the video stream in the thing description. And then the web client directly fetches that 
that uh, video stream. It can be tricky because cameras use lots of different video formats, streaming formats, container formats, encoding formats, and not all of them are directly compatible with the web. So in a previous experiment, we had a system which transcoded um, video, but that can be pretty tough for um, gateway hardware, which isn't always that powerful. So you can provide a video stream URL directly in a, in a thing description, or you can have a gateway which converts that video stream from one format into another format, which is more compatible with the web. Great. Thanks so much. Our next question is on row 39 and came in anonymously, anonymously via Telegram. Uh, do we have any materials available to assist if we want to host our own IoT workshop? Sure. I mean, let us know what you need. So. Um, there's the slides I showed you today, which you're welcome to steal and mangle and do whatever you like with. Um, and my colleague, Kathy, does a lot of workshops all over the place. She gives talks at conferences. She's got a bunch of material and example things that she's built. Another good source of uh, examples is uh, the Hacks blog, where we have fairly regular blog posts uh, giving examples of how to build web things, how to build adapters. Um, but if there's something you think is missing and that you need to, to run a workshop, then let us know. You can email us iot at mozilla.com and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to help you out. Thank you. And we'll be following up with Ben to uh, hopefully get a link to the slides. That way we can add them to our uh, slide deck repository that we have for tech speakers. If that's all right with you, Ben. Sure. And uh, I believe there's one more question on row 43. Um, is unsupported software a major concern for the lifespan of smart and connected devices uh, in terms of products? Oh, see, we actually have a little bit of an answer here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would you mind speaking on that for a quick moment? Yeah, sure. So um, it is a huge problem. I mean, if you think about the lifespan of things in your home, like light switches, I mean, how long have you had the light switch in your home? And probably a much longer time span than the average software app you know, is supported for. So this is a big problem for IoT in general. Our hope by defining standards like the Web of Things is that these things are going to stick around for a lot longer. And even if one particular company or cloud service disappears, your things aren't just going to stop working. Um, you should still be able to do those things. You should, uh, if they can be controlled locally, if they expose a standard Web Thing API that someone else can write an interface to, it makes it much easier for those things to um, be useful over a, over a long longer period of time. Absolutely. Well, I believe that's all the questions we have in the Etherpad. Um, Javi, unless you had any questions come in over Telegram uh, to you personally? Uh, I have not seen any additional questions, so I think we're good. And I did, I added uh, some of the links that um, Ben was talking about uh, into the Etherpad. And uh, tune in tomorrow, roughly 8 a.m. Pacific or 5, no. 4 p.m. 4 or 5 UTC um, in your evening at dinner tomorrow night. You can read the next um, episode in the um, Things Framework collection. So yeah, very good. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for joining us today and providing us with a thorough thorough explanation of uh, Web of Things. We would really very much look forward to it. And uh, thank you so much. And, yeah, thanks um, very much for having me. And please do join us on IRC if you have any more questions. And um, I will be getting, uh, getting us some uh, captions for this recording. And at that time, I usually post the recording, the briefings up to YouTube. So for folks who have an easier time accessing YouTube and for you to share more widely, Ben, I'll be sharing that uh, URL probably early next week. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Javi. Good evening. Thanks so much. Day. Cheers. Be well. Bye-bye.